Would you thank the worship team with me one time? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, it's so good to be with you this morning in the house of God. We're continuing with our Moving Forward series. Uh, Pastor Brian touched on moving forward in faith. Uh, today, I'm going to be touching on moving forward with hope. Uh, if you don't know, or maybe you've never been there, how many know there are times in life where we come across in a hopeless time? Well, we've been in a dark place and without hope. And I want to go to Job 8.13 on the screen there. I'm going to pull it up. Job 8.13, and it says this. That what happen, that's what happens to all who forget God and their hopes come to nothing. The point of that message is, the point of that, sermon, that uh, scripture there is, the, is that those who forget God have no hope. And I've been there through experience not having God in my life and being at a place where there's no hope. You don't know whether you're up, whether you're down, you don't know where to turn to, but you're in a state of hopelessness. And so this morning, if you find yourself in a place of hopelessness, I want to give you a word this morning to let you know that there is hope. No matter what you're going through, what you're facing, what you've encountered, how it feels, or what it may look like, but there is hope for you this morning. So stay with me this morning. Let's go to Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. And it says this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it men of old gain approval. So what is it, what is this assurance? What are the things hoped for? What is that talking about? The things hoped for are promises that God deposits in our lives. And even though we don't necessarily see it and hear it and the here and now, guess what? If we don't see it, we don't, we don't uh, see it. It's not right before our eyes. Guess what? We still have hope, don't we? We have faith that the hope for promises which are God's best for you and I will happen. It's the very things that God has promised to you and I through his word, the very things that he has revealed to you and I. How many know God is not a liar? And so those very things that God has promised to you and I are the very things that we hold on to. Hope says, I am convinced that doing it things God's way is the best way. How many of you have done it your way? Anybody there? How many of you that doesn't work out too good all the time? We know that God's way is best. And when we settle that issue in our hearts, it is then that we will experience assurance, confidence, and true direction in our lives from the one who has called us to live this life. Who called us? God did. God has called us. And so it's his very words that is revealed in his, in his written word, the promises that we hold on to. So let me share with you what hope is not. Hope is not op optimism. Uh, though it is a, it's better to be optimistic than pessimist, true, but sometimes being optimistic uh, doesn't deal with reality. Uh, how many have been in a bad situation where it's been a bad situation, but you're being, hope, you're being optimistic? Oh, it's good. You're, you're lying to yourself. It's really not good. <laughs> Matter of fact, it's really bad. So optimism will be out of, a, out of touch with reality. It's better than being pessimist. But hope is being in touch with reality, and it sounds kind of like this. Yes, the situation that I'm in is bad. a matter of fact, it's really bad. And if I really think about it, it's probably never been this worse ever in my life, but I believe. I believe what? I believe in the promises that God has given me. It's the very hope that I hold on to. I believe the matter is settled in our heart and in our mind. What God has said is true. And I believe what he has said to me and revealed through his Bible, through the word of God. Hebrews 6.18. Hebrews 6.18 says this. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have a great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. How many are taking refuge in God this morning? We're running to him because you know what? It is the place that we find refuge. It is in God himself that we find refuge. Did you know there's over 7,000 promises in the word of God to you and I? And then we wonder why it's so important for you and I to read the word of God because it tells us the very things that he's going to do specifically and assures us that he will perform these very things in the believer's life. Over 7,000 promises to you and I. And that's why we encourage to read your word. Know what God is saying to you. 
Understand what he will do for you, what he will do because he said he's going to do it. The believer has the unchangeable, these two unchangeable things, which is we rely on God's word and his oath to you and I. God's promise is to save all who believe on Christ, and he confirms it with an oath. So the conclusion is that we as believers are secure in God's hands. How many know that that's a safe place to be? It's like Allstate, we're in good hands. <laughs> the very place, that, where else would you rather be when things are going awry, when things are difficult, when things are hard, when things are just, you can't, it seems hopeless. What other place would you rather be than in God's hands? It's a place where we take refuge. It's where we find our hope. See, there's different types of hope, and I think I shared a little bit with it during prayer last week. But one, there's wishful hope, right? There's a wishful hope. Say some of us came to church this morning. Uh, we're running late. You get in the car. Your husband didn't put gas like he told him to. The kids, you're fighting with them, dragging in them to get in the car and get dressed and all the above. And so you're driving and trying to get to church because you're supposed to be there before everyone else is. But the light turns red. And you just hope that it turns green soon because you got to get there. But you and I know that light's not going to turn green until it's time, right? It's on, a, it's on a system. So we're a wishful hope. I hope that light turns green. I just explained some of you guys' drive to church this morning, didn't I? <laughs> I'm not going to look up because I don't want to see this. <laughs> and you also had a glimpse into my life. <laughs> Kids are crazy. <laughs> Secondly, there's an expectant hope. Expecting hope is this, that you actually do something with expectation that something's going to happen. So you put something into action, like you plant some tomato seeds, and hopefully you're going to get something when the season's right and it grows. You're going to get something. So you put something into action. There's an expectant hope. You're expecting to receive something. Something's going to happen. You're with expectation because you did something. But then there's another different, a different type of hope. And this is the hope that I want to zero in is It is a certain hope. Knowing for certain it will come to pass, even though I do not see it. Why? Because God said it. God said it, so I know it's going to happen. And that is my hope. That's the very thing that I hold on to. It's what has been revealed through God's promises. And what did the scripture say? God is not a liar. God is not a liar. It is certain hope. Hebrews 6.19 says this. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. The hope that you and I should have as believers is a hope that is strong and that is trustworthy. It doesn't shift with every blowing of the wind and, and everything that happens in life. I mean, a lot of stuff happens in life, doesn't it? We go through a lot of things in life. A lot of things, curveballs come our way and different types of death and illness and, and just all sorts of stuff happen into our life. But our hope is an anchor for our soul. So that we're not just shifting every which way, whatever life throws at us, but that we are solidified in what we believe. And that is God and his word. The bullet point on your outline says an anchor for our souls. What does the anchor do for a boat? Well, the anchor keeps it from drifting into unsafe waters, right? So you don't crash into the rocks. How many know there's unsafe waters in our life that sometimes that life, it can be doubt and despair and discouragement in our life. And our hope that is in Christ is what anchors us and keeps us from drifting away into those things that overtake our life like discouragement, despair. How many of us are, are dealing, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of us are dealing with some things in our life that are, that are heavy this morning? You come in this place and you know what, there's some things going on. Maybe it's not you personally, but it might be your, your wife or your husband or your children. It might be your neighbor. It might be your coworker. It might be something that's going on and you're just, you just, you feel the storms of life. Well, it's our anchor that keeps us solidified, that keeps us from turning over with the storms of this life. It gives us stability in life's storms. Our hope is secured in God's very presence that is behind the veil. How many know we serve a God who is full of glory, a God who is awesome, a God who is above and beyond anything we can think or imagine? That's the kind of God we serve, and our hope is anchored in that, in him, that we are behind the curtain with him, that we see him for who he is. So I want to give out a couple of uh, common causes for hopelessness this morning. One of them being you feel alone or abandoned. 
I mean, when you feel alone or abandoned, you can be in a room just like this and still feel alone. Because nobody knows what you're going through. Nobody knows what you've gone through. Nobody understands where you've been or what, where you're headed. And you feel alone. Abandonment, that could be all the way from your childhood of, of a parent leaving you. And you've carried that with you all your life into your adulthood. How many understand that? Feeling that, aband that abandonment. Well, if my parent or my loved one did that to me, well, how is God going to be any different? We struggle with that in our lives. Feeling hopeless. We got any control freaks in here? When your life seems out of control, how many know that can throw you for a loop and it can lead to hopelessness because you can't do anything about what's going on in your life. It's out of your hands. It's, it's bigger than you. It's greater than you. And there's nothing you can do about it. But is there? Yes, there is. It might be out of your hands, but how many know it's not out of God's hands? You're grieving a loss. Maybe you lost a loved one. Now we know that can be a hard thing and lead you to a place hopelessness you're just grieving for the, for that for that individual something that's been severed and, and there's nothing you can do about it and it leads you to a state of hopelessness maybe you've done something wrong maybe you're in this place this morning you felt like you've done something wrong that that God can't forgive you if God can use me he can use anybody <laughs> let that give you some hope this morning there's nothing that God can't forgive you it's already done it was done on the cross Don't let the enemy guilt you or shame you so that you build resentment and you don't come to where the meeting's at of the house of God, with the people of God. Maybe you've been deeply wounded, huh? been abused physically, mentally, verbally. I mean, no, you carry wounds like that. It leads you to a place where no one understands and you feel hopeless at times. There's a remedy. Anybody ever been a, a dollar... Short and a day late all the time. Just can't. Just feel like you just can't get ahead, man. No matter what you do, it's like, man, life is defeat. I feel like defeated, man. I give my best. I do my best. I try as hard as I can. And I still can't get it. I call you brother or sister. Can't get it right. It's all right. God still loves you. Sometimes we feel like, man, I just life's never going to change. It just is what it is. Woe is me. Life is what it is. Sarah, Sarah. There's hope. There's hope, church. These are all very common things that can bring on hopelessness in our life. And maybe you experienced one of them or maybe you experienced all of them. Maybe you're in the middle of it right now and you feel hopeless. I think we've all been there one time or another in our life. If we're not there right now, I believe we've all touched on those subjects in our life where we feel hopeless in those areas but there is hope. So I want to give you some solutions for hopelessness. Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ as the son is in charge of God's entire house. And we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in who? In Christ. In Christ. In Christ, all that is answered. All your hopelessness, all that you're going through, all that you feel, all that it seems like it can't be get like you can't get over it. It's in Christ that we find our hope. He is our confidence. It's where we can take courage and remain confident that you know what what God said it will be and it will come to pass. God is not a liar. It's the anchor for my soul. It's the very thing that keeps me keeping, keeping on. It's the very thing that we can grab a hold of. It's tangible. And you know what? It's going to be all right. Because he said it will be. He said it, and he's not a liar. God said it, and he's not a liar. You're a new creation in Christ. You're a child of God. He loves you. You're forgiven. It's what he said. 1 Peter 3.15 says this. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. So when you find yourself in a hopeless situation, you can either worship God or you can worry. Would you write that one down? You can worship or you can worry. I told you a, a couple weeks back when I spoke last that I went through a difficult season in my life where I got hit from all areas of my life. Because I got hit from everywhere. 
If you guys remember that story that I told you. And how I got through that season of my life, which was a long season, is because I worshiped God through it. And I'm here standing today because I worshiped him, I adored him, I believed in him, and I, under, I understood what he said to me, and I grabbed a hold of that, and that was the anchor for my soul through that whole season, and just worshiping God. And I'm standing here today. And it's the same for you. You can choose to either worry, or you can choose to worship God when you find yourself in a hopeless situation. My advice to you, my encouragement to you, my, the word of God to you this morning would say, worship the Lord. Draw near to him. Give him thanks for everything that you have. Don't look at what you don't have, but look at what you do have. You have the breath of life. You're able to get up out of bed. You're able to be here. Amen. Worship him. He is worthy of it. Luke 18, 1 says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and what? Not give up. Always pray and not give up. Well, it looks bad. Continue to pray. Well, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Continue to pray. Don't give up. He is faithful. So you can pray or you can panic. Anybody panic in here? <laughs> is it me? <laughs> the tire's flat. Oh, no. <laughs> we panic. We freak out. Man, we, we serve the God of this universe. He spoke things into existence. And it's the very God who's watching over for us and is looking out for us. And we panic at times. We freak out like chickens with cut off heads running around. Oh, no, what am I going to do? <laughs> Pray. Ask him. Seek him. It says that if we draw near to him, his promise is that he'll draw near to us. He told his disciples, pray and don't give up. So here's a couple of things that I want you to know as before we leave this place. Is number one, if you write this down, God will never abandon me. Would you repeat that with me? God will never abandon me. God will never abandon me. Make that personal to your life. Know that God is not going to leave you. He's not going to abandon you. Deuteronomy 4.31 says this, For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon you or destroy you. Or forget the solemn covenant he made with your ancestors. He is a merciful God. Do you know him? He's a God who won't flake on you. How many of you have had people flake on them? Can't catch it. Right at the store, man. God does not like people. He won't leave you hanging. He won't forsake you. He won't abandon you. He's a covenant God. He's a God who keeps his covenant. He's a God who keeps his promises. He's a merciful God. Do you know him? Deuteronomy 31, 6 says this. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Your translations may say he may never leave you nor forsake you. My God will not fail you. He will not abandon you. And catch this. Here's the Israelites going out to fight and take the promised land, what God has promised them. And he says, I will personally go before you. I will personally go before you. He's not a God that's out in the stars somewhere. He's not a God that's far-fetched in some story or fable that we heard. He's a God who is involved in your life. He's a God who will go before you in the very difficult battles that you face and personally go before you because he loves you. God will go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. You got trust issues? You can trust God. Walk with him. Know him. Speak to him. And let him speak to you. He's a God who is personal. Number two, if you write this down, God has a greater plan for my life. How many like to make their own plans? Do it their way. It usually doesn't work out, right? We make plans and it usually does Well, for me anyways, maybe I'm just a... <laughs> just, I just got bad luck. I don't know. But God has a greater plan for your life. Who better to have a plan for your life than God himself who created you, who knows the most intricate parts about you, of your life, and who you are. God has a greater plan for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, everybody knows this scripture. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, I know everybody wants the Rolls Royce, right? God didn't give it to you because you probably would have crashed it. 
I know you want a mansion. Well, that's waiting for you in heaven. So if we just follow God's plan, I know we want certain things in life. And our, sometimes our plan doesn't look like God's plan. I mean, no, we want the best, right? We want this and that and these different things. God gives us what we need. God gives us what we can handle. And God is faithful to make sure he meets every need in our life. I can, I can testify to that. That everything you need in your life, God will meet the need. But you might not get the Rolls Royce. Don't, don't trip out. God's plan for you is better than anything you can conjure up. Believe that. Anything you can think of in your head, God's plan for you is, is always better. Hebrews 10.23 says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promises what? That was weak. He is what? He's faithful. He is faithful, church. You got to believe it. I believe it, but you got to believe it. He is faithful, church. Sometimes the fight is just to hold on, isn't it? Sometimes the fight is just to hold on to what he has promised us. And that's the fight. Fighting the good fight is just sometimes just holding on unswervingly. Nothing's going to sway me. Nothing's going to persuade me. Nothing's going to move me from there. I am, I am solidified. I am anchored down in what God has promised me. Why? Because he is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. Romans 8, 28 says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. When you're going through it, it might not look like it's good. It might not feel like it's good. You might not even understand what's going on. But on the other side, if, if you're doing it faithfully, the way God has called you to walk through that, he's going to work it to your good and his glory. Always. Because he's faithful. We might not like the process, but we like the results, don't we? Trust God through the process, church. Through whatever you're going through, trust him that he is working something out. In Romans uh, uh, number three, if you, God has promised to help me. Write that down. God has promised to help me. In Romans five, verses three through five says this, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Anybody doing that right now, rejoicing when you run into problems and trials? I'm still working on that. So <laughs> it goes on to say, for we know that they help us to develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not, this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Church, do you really know how much God loves you? Do you understand how much he loves you, church? That even through the troubles and trials that we run into, God is doing something even in the midst of those things. That he's building up something in us, an endurance and a strength and a character so that we can hold on to the confident hope of our salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. The hope that we put into God, the hope that we hold on to his promises and to his word, the word of God says we will not be disappointed. We will not be disappointed, church. Because, why? Because we know how much he loves us. We know how much he loves us. That he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. It's a deposit that he's put into us, that he loves us that much. Some of us struggle with being loved, huh? Some of us don't know what true love is. We, we, we've known tainted love and, and love in the world, but we don't really know how God loves us. And if you leave with anything today, know this, that God loves you, that he won't abandon you, he won't give up on you, that he will personally go before you in everything that you face, church. And lastly, on our outline here, Psalm 33, 18, and it says this, but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, who are reverent towards him, and those who hope in his unfailing love. How much did he love us, church? This much. He gave his only begotten son for you and I. So that we can have an everlasting life with him. And that we even now reap the benefits in the here and now, church. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up at this time. Would you stand with me, church? Would you get your elements if you don't have them? Ask one of the ushers, please.
Colossians 127 says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. As uh, Pastor Brian and I were, we've been doing a lot of funerals lately. And to come to that place that we're all going to come one day. It's that hope that we have, the hope of glory, that Christ in you. That you know what, that life doesn't stop here, but that we wake up in eternity and we're going to spend life with him. With God himself. In Matthew it says this, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Paul goes on to say in the Bible that it's at this time where we remember what Christ, who he is, and what he's done. But that at this time, as we take communion and we remember what Christ has done for us and who he is, it's where we search our hearts. And Paul says that we don't take it in an unworthy manner. What does that mean? That means that we search our hearts as we go before God and we take these elements. We say, Lord, search our heart. Is there anything in here that needs to be changed? Has it gotten calloused over time, Lord God? Have I gotten far from my first love? You, Lord. Is there an attitude in me that that is not in step with you or your spirit, my God? So let us bow our heads at this time. Father, we humbly come before you, and Lord, as the minister of giving this message today, I pray, Lord God, that you would search my heart, Lord. God, if there's anything that is, anything, any resentment or bitterness or unforgiveness, Lord, anything in my heart that doesn't represent you, Lord, I ask you to remove it. Forgive me, Father. Forgive me for my sins. Cleanse me. Let my hands be clean as I lift them to you and worship, O oh God. Let my mind be on you, Lord. Let my eyes be on you, Lord God. That I not take this in an unworthy manner, Lord. For I realize the cost of my salvation, the price that was paid for my life. Thank you, Jesus. Forgive us, Lord, if there's any sin among us, Lord. Wash us and cleanse us, oh God. This time, would you take the bread, please? Which represents his body that was broken for us. It was our substitute, and he took our punishment. The word of God says that he was beaten beyond recognition for our sake. Thank you, Lord. Take the cup that represents his blood. It was poured out for the remission of our sins, that we would be forgiven. And have everlasting life. Partake of the cup. I just want to say a prayer over you. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Lord, this is a holy moment that we remember what your son did for us, oh God. The pain that he endured, Lord God, for us. For the joy set before him. We thank you for the precious gift, Lord God, of Jesus Christ, your son. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that you have not left us as orphans, Lord. But you have given us your spirit that dwells in us. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we could have new life in you. I pray for your people this morning, Lord God, if there's anybody in this place, oh God, who is dealing with hopelessness, that they would turn to you this morning, Lord, and find your love and find the hope that you promised through your word. God, you are faithful. And I thank you for every life that is in here, Lord. Let your people be the salt to this earth. Let their deeds go known in this land that they do it for you, Lord God. And bring glory to your name by their good deeds and their words and their actions, Father. Let your people be the church, Lord God. Be your hands and your feet, Lord. To go into the broken places, Lord. To restore, Lord God, families and children and those that are without you, God. 
Let us bring that hope that you give us to others, Father, into those darkened places that we would be the light you've called us to be. And in Jesus' name.